Uh, today we have the pleasure of hearing about some of the work being done at the Dubin Breast Center, including some of the late, latest treatment options. The talk will be moderated by Dr. Lisa Port, the System Chief for Breast Surgery and the Director of the Dubin Breast Center. Our speakers will be Dr. Amy Tiersten, Dr. Anya Romanoff, and Dr. Hank Schmidt. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, we look forward to giving um, a bit of an update from the Dubin Breast Center every year to our colleagues in medicine who we view as our partners in the care of all of our patients. We're so, first of all, grateful for your collaboration um, on our mutual patients and really feel like um, we're here to serve you in terms of our mutual patients and their overall well-being. There is a lot that is going on in the Dubin Breast Center and just I want to give you a two-minute update before we go to our speakers. We have a really ambitious agenda with three speakers, but we have a lot to share with you. So as you know, the Dubin Breast Center opened in 2011 and we've experienced extraordinary growth from that time. We started out in 2011 with 13,000 new visits a year and we're up to over 30,000 projected for 2019 and this includes surgery, medical oncology, radiology visits and all kinds of other services we provide. We have expanded our physical footprint. We have four more infusion suites to accommodate our growing volume. Um, and those are opening in the next month. Um, it's interesting to know we started out with a very modest group of nine physicians. We're now at 24, including five surgeons, six oncologists, seven radiologists, and one psychiatrist. And I want you to keep in mind that all of these physicians, surgeons, oncologists, radiologists are breast specific, breast specialized, and breast only. We really, I feel, run a true multidisciplinary care environment in a very patient-centered environment. We provide a wealth of other services for the, for the benefit of our patient beyond just basic medical treatment. So for example, um, we've developed a cold cap program I see our dear manager, Raina Karidi, in the back, who is instrumental in getting that going. And this allows for hair preservation in our patients who undergo chemotherapy. We have a full-time nutritionist for patients to manage weight gain and weight loss during their treatment. We have complete social work services and support programs, including yoga that are free, that we run in our waiting rooms. And these are available to, to patients regardless of their ability to pay. We have a full service genetic testing and counseling service embedded in our center. We have full service imaging. I always brag that we were the first in New York City to offer 3D mammography. And it's now offered at all our system sites and really has become the standard of care. Um, and we have a very robust research program. We offer between 20 and 30 clinical trials. And I say, I use that number loosely because at any given time, one trial is opening and another is closing. And you'll hear about some of those exciting trials from Dr. Tiersten. Um, and it's important to know that these trials span the range of stages in breast cancer. We offer a trial for observation only in DCIS, a very controversial area, stage zero breast cancer, all the way up to options for treatment in metastatic disease for those who have failed um, conventional therapy. Today, who you'll hear from is my um, dear colleagues and friends. First, Dr. Hank Schmidt, MD, PhD, who's an associate professor of breast surgery and director of our care or high risk program. He's going to talk to you about a new program we have called IORT or intraoperative radiation therapy. And what that does is um, offers patients some new cutting edge treatments as they relate to radiation. Um, Dr. Anya Romanoff, who is an assistant professor of breast surgery and global health as well. And she's going to speak to us about the rising de-escalation of chemotherapy, meaning the decrease use of chemotherapy in our patient populations. I think this is really important for all of you to know as we share patients, they come back to you and say, guess what? I didn't need chemotherapy even though my tumor was large or my lymph nodes were involved. And I think that's important for primary care providers and internists to understand why there's um, a trend in that direction. And lastly, um, you'll hear from Amy Tiersten, professor of medicine and clinical director of breast medical oncology regarding the newest options in treatment and clinical trials. So without further delay, um, Dr. Schmidt. Go 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hank Schmidt, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about one of the um, exciting options for uh, patients being treated for breast cancer at Mount Sinai. Uh, we started a IORT program at Mount Sinai. I've been uh, adding patients in a registry format now for about a year. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so the standard of care for treatment of patients with early stage breast cancer, as you are aware, is either mastectomy for some patients or breast conserving surgery, namely lumpectomy with clear margins followed by radiotherapy. Um, this figure as well as the next one are collections of data from the early breast cancer trialist collaborative group that document or uh, demonstrate a uh, very um, significant effect of radiotherapy in preventing local recurrence, both in node negative and in node positive patients. In some groups of these studies, um, the effect is significant, perhaps 30 to 40 percent reduction. Um, these are a similar, somewhat overlapping group of studies stretching back to the early 1980s that again show for most patients um, that radiotherapy does have an important effect for those patients who choose to save the breast. When we look over a longer period of time, we can see a small but consistent and measurably significant increase or advantage in survival as well for patients treated with radiotherapy. So the standard external beam radiation treatment typically happens about three to four weeks after surgery. Uh, the total dose is 50 gray. This is typically administered Monday through Friday in a daily treatment on 25 fractions, so over five weeks. More recently, we've been able to embrace a more abbreviated schedule called hypofractionated radiation treatments. This is 16 fractions. The patients can typically be treated with a slightly different schedule over three weeks. The trials that have explored this against standard external beam treatment show equivalent control and cosmetic outcome. So the advantage of this is this treatment is very well tolerated. Uh, in general, um, patients are able to receive optimal local disease control, um, use CT planning to allow very precise field definition um, to uh, treat a specific uh, region. The downside of this, however, is that there's skin reaction that, as I'm sure you've seen, typically involves a uh, majority of one side of the chest. Um, this is an inconvenient process for patients who are required to be close to a radiation treatment center daily um, for a period of three to five weeks. Patients experience fatigue while they're on treatment, and even though our technology is much better over the last few years, there's still dose and exposure radiation to surrounding anatomy, most notably heart and lungs, um, which is an issue for patients with underlying heart and lung disease. So because of those downsides, people have developed uh, partial breast irradiation therapy, or APBI. APBI is sort of an umbrella term that encompasses a variety of techniques. Uh, the one we're going to focus on today is IORT, intraoperative radiotherapy. It is also defined by IMRT, or intensity modulated radiotherapy, interstitial brachytherapy, which most recently has been done in the form of a mammocyte balloon catheter, and then 3D conformal external radiotherapy as well. All of these techniques take advantage of the concept that we can treat a very small focused area, namely the lumpectomy bed or lumpectomy cavity, while sparing the remainder of the organ and minimizing radiation exposure to the rest of the patient, as well as their immediate environment. So the system that's most widely used in the United States is IntraBeam. This is produced by Zeiss, and this is a photo of the device. It has a large floor stand with an arm with a number of articulating joints attached to a source and an applicator. We'll take a closer look at this. These are the applicators which come in a variety of sizes. Obviously different patients and different tumors have various size lumpectomy cavities. And so the surgeon chooses the right size applicator once the lumpectomy is completed. The applicator is attached to the arm. You can see the tip of the uh, applicator is sort of a glass sphere which goes into the lumpectomy cavity. This is the applicator attached to the HDR, high dose rate source, which generates um, x-rays. So this is essentially what the source looks like inside that applicator. Um, this probe, essentially at the end of it, uh, produces a very discrete sphere of radiation treatment in the form of 
uh, high dose, low energy x-rays. Um, the unique thing about this system is uh, it can be used in any operating room. It does not require shielding as more traditional um, IORT devices in the past. Uh, the way that is accomplished is a very rapid dose fall off as you move away from the sphere of the applicator. And that's shown in this figure here. You can see along the X axis is increasing distance from the applicator surface and dose along the Y axis. We intend to provide 20 gray dose right at the lumpectomy cavity bed or the margin of our tumor resection. You can see here that as you move away one centimeter, your dose is already down to five gray. By the time you get to two centimeters, your dose is less than one. So uh, essentially we can do this anywhere in the operating room without concern for people in the hallway or people in the adjacent room. It's very convenient for us to move the device around the operating room. This is what it looks like with a patient. You can see the uh, applicator extending through the incision of the lumpectomy cavity and uh, the, the source is inside the breast there. Uh, this is another photo that shows our old format of external shielding we use to minimize room scatter. You can see at the foot of the bed there's a uh, lead shield. Behind that in some environments is a radiation control console. Uh, the next photo shows that um, in some operating rooms, the anesthesiologist can stay inside the room, also behind a lead shield. In other formats, they'll step outside and look through a window, or the patient can be monitored. Uh, this picture shows a surgeon securing a purse string suture. We place that in the breast above the applicator to sort of secure the breast tissue flat against the surface of the applicator so we get uh, even dose delivery right along the edge of the lumpectomy cavity. Uh, sometimes the radiation oncologist will also be um, scrubbed in or at least in the operating room to ensure correct placement of the probe. We want to minimize any toxicity to the skin above the lumpectomy cavity. So what are the results from this device? The major study that was reported in Lancet uh, was a target trial. This is targeted intraoperative radiotherapy. This was an international study across 33 centers in Europe and the United States that explored in a randomized fashion uh, IORT using this intrabeam device against traditional external beam radiotherapy. 3,451 patients randomized uh, received either standard treatment or a single intraop dose. Important to know that Patients who on their pathology results that came back a few days later, if they had positive margins, if they had positive nodes or extensive amount of DCIS, they went on to also get external beam radiotherapy after their intraop dose. Um, the outcome showed uh, essentially similar local control. This was a non-inferiority design. And so the results showed that in fact, um, there was no significant difference between these two approaches. When we limit the analysis to patients who had IORT dose at the time of tumor resection, the difference was only about 1% in local recurrence. The trial also reported similar complication rate, similar cosmetic outcomes, and similar mortality. Uh, this trial is still in the follow-up phase, and subsequent reports are expected. This is the first five years of follow-up. You can see events of local recurrence are spread pretty evenly over five years. Ten in the intra-op group, six in the external beam group. ASTRO, or the American Society of Radiation Oncology, evaluates all this APBI data from a number of devices and studies and produces guidelines. We've use these guidelines to uh, develop a registry trial for our use here at Mount Sinai over the last year. Um, our criteria are approximately what are recommended by ASTRO in 2016. We want to target <laughs> relatively low risk patients, um, typically over the age of 50 with somewhat smaller tumors, um, primarily limiting it to an invasive disease at this point, although there is growing data in DCIS. We want to make sure patients have widely negative margins and we're focused right now on patients with ER positive breast cancers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. And we just wanted to present this to you to show you some of the newer offerings that we have at the Dubin Breast Center. It's really been quite remarkable to have appropriately selected patients come in and to be able to say to them, if they, especially if they're in 
geographic areas where radiation isn't readily available that we can deliver your radiation at the time of surgery. It's really actually quite novel and Dr. Schmidt is spearheaded bringing this, um, this incredibly exciting uh, treatment option to our patient population. So um, uh, really happy to have you know about that. Our next speaker, Dr. Anya Romanoff, is going to speak to you today about trends in de-escalating chemotherapy in our estrogen receptor positive patients. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, as Dr. Port said, I will be talking about assessing the need for chemotherapy in this age of personalized breast cancer care. I have no disclosures. So by way of background, overall chemotherapy and hormonal therapy reduce breast cancer mortality by about one third. Historically, chemotherapy was given to all patients with large tumors or positive lymph nodes. However, in the last several decades, this has really begun to change as we learn more and more about breast cancer. So in 1985, the National Institute of Health put out a consensus statement that chemotherapy does not improve survival for women with negative lymph nodes. About three years later, the National Cancer Institute said essentially the opposite, that chemotherapy does have a potential benefit for uh, women with negative lymph nodes. In the year 2000, the NIH essentially said chemotherapy can potentially benefit everyone, that it improves survival and should be recommended to the majority of women with breast cancer regardless of their nodal, menopausal, or hormone receptor status. So how did we get from this blanket statement of chemotherapy for all to where we are today in an era of really individualized care. Um, well, we've learned a lot about the biology of disease and the ability to use that to predict um, someone's risk of recurrence uh, as well as their response to chemotherapy. So a quick case presentation, and we'll come back to this patient at the end of the talk as well. A 57-year-old woman uh, presents with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, undergoes a lumpectomy and a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and on final pathology is found to have a 2.3 centimeter tumor and negative lymph nodes. About 10 years ago, this woman would have received chemotherapy, and we'll talk about why today maybe she would not. So a lot of this um, development in hormone receptor positive disease has come out of uh, a recurrence score, which was initially described in 2004 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was a multi-gene assay that was used to predict recurrence of tamoxifen-treated node-negative breast cancer. This group used a 21 gene analysis to calculate a recurrence score and stratify women with ER positive breast cancer into low, intermediate, and high risk groups. They then found that women who fell into this low risk group on a score of 0 to 100 had a distant recurrence rate at 10 years of 6.8%. The intermediate risk group had about a 14% risk of recurrence at 10 years. And the high risk group had over a 30% risk of recurrence at 10 years. And subsequently, these different groups have been studied to, um, to display how they would potentially respond from chemother to chemotherapy. So also in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a large um, prospective trial looking at how these people respond to chemo. So women with a low risk score of zero to 10, whether they received chemotherapy or chemotherapy, uh, excuse me, or endocrine therapy alone, had no difference in their uh, recurrence-free survival or overall survival from breast cancer at five years. Namely, that these people did not benefit from the receipt of chemotherapy. And their overall survival was 99%. Women with a high risk score greater than or equal to 31 did benefit from chemotherapy. So those who received tamoxifen and chemotherapy in the blue line had significantly better distant uh, disease-free recurrence than those who received tamoxifen alone. The question was what to do with the women who fell in this intermediate risk group. And for a while, these people were receiving chemotherapy on the whole. And a large study was published last year in June called the Taylor X trial that looked at adjuvant chemotherapy for this intermediate risk group. They stratified women who had an intermediate risk score that in this study was defined as between 11 and 25, and they randomized them to either endocrine therapy alone or chemoendocrine therapy. 
And what they found was that overall, women who fell into this intermediate category had no benefit from chemotherapy, that they had similar disease-free recurrence and overall survival, whether they received endocrine therapy alone or chemotherapy and endocrine therapy together. The one um, subset of patients who did potentially have a benefit from chemotherapy in this study were women who were under the age of 50 uh, with an intermediate risk score of above 15. And so what they concluded from this trial was that the 21 gene assay may identify up to 85% of women with early stage breast cancer who can be spared adjuvant chemotherapy. And the groups of patients who could potentially be spared chemotherapy are those who are greater than 50 years of, old, of age with a recurrence score of 25 or less, or those who are under 50 years of age with a recurrence score of under 15. And so we've really now implemented these guidelines at the Dubin Breast Center to potentially spare many women um, the side effects of chemotherapy. Our group subsequently published uh, results of a national cancer database study that was aimed to determine the practice changing potential of this TaylorX trial that came out last year. We looked at over 37,000 patients who had an intermediate risk score and looked at trends over time. From 2010 to 2015, the use of chemotherapy in all patients decreased. These patients were then broken down into several groups Groups A and C in the blue and green lines toward the bottom of the screen would not, following the publication of TaylorX, be recommended to have chemotherapy. So these are women under the age of 50 with a in lower intermediate risk score or over the age of 50 with any intermediate score. The group B in the yellow, as we said, are patients who are 50 or younger with a recurrence score of 16 to 25 who actually would be recommended to have chemotherapy following the results of TaylorX. So this is one group where potentially overall TaylorX could change management as we see these people received less chemotherapy over the last five years when in fact perhaps they should be considered for more. And so to come back to our case presentation of this 57-year-old woman with a 2.3 centimeter ER positive tumor and negative lymph nodes who 10 years ago would have received chemotherapy, today would have had a recurrence score sent. And if this returned a lower intermediate score, for example, 15, which this patient did have, she now can be spared chemotherapy, spared the side effects, and we can assure her that her overall survival and her distant disease-free survival are excellent regardless. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romanoff. We really, I really felt like this was an important topic to cover because as you see more of these patients circling back to you with, uh, with recommendations for no chemotherapy, it's important to understand the rationale for this. And um, we're thrilled that we're able to do that in this age of no one size fits all. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, while we're de-escalating ke um, chemotherapy use in appropriate patients, it is important to know that, again, breast cancer is not one disease. It's a, a lot of different diseases with a lot of different biologic potentials. And um, while the cure rate for breast cancer is extremely high overall, there are subsets of patients with breast cancer who do not enjoy those high cure rates and who have biologically aggressive disease. And so again, in the age of personalized care, it's important that we can pick and choose who can benefit for, from which treatments. And you just learned a bit about which patients we, we don't think need chemotherapy and more importantly, are going to enjoy an excellent overall prognosis even without it. But what do we do for those patients with biologically aggressive breast cancers or those patients who fail first-line therapy and recur who have metastatic disease. So one of our commitments, of course, at the Dubin Breast Center is to provide a multitude of treatment options for second and third-line treatment um, so that we can give our patients the best chances for survival and quality of life. And Amy Tiersen has been sort of our secret weapon at the Dubin Breast Center, developing and bringing online these clinical trials so that we have so much to offer for patients who failed these treatments. And I'd like for her to speak to you about some of these incredible trials that, that she has spearheaded. Oh, I think it's, no, here, I got it. Yeah. Um, 
I'm very excited to be able to share with you all um, some of the very exciting advances. It's a very exciting time for the treatment of breast cancer. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, the objectives of my uh, talk today are to review some of the latest advances in breast cancer and to familiarize you all with a few of the clinical trials available at the Dubin Breast Center. As Dr. Port mentioned, we have a very large menu of clinical trials to address every specific subtype of breast cancer and every stage of breast cancer. In the interest of time, I'll only be able to share a, f a smattering, but here we go. So there's really been a revolution in all of oncology and it really is the age of targeted therapy or precision medicine. So uh, traditional prognostic factors such as size of the cancer, number of positive axillary lymph nodes, while they're still important, there's been a tremendous shift in understanding now that actually the biological subtype, um, and in, in, for example, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor expression, as well as the protein HER2 nu, actually dictate prognosis um, more so than um, arbitrary cutoffs in terms of size of the cancer. And we really um, gear our treatment based on these specific biological subtypes which have very different behaviors. So in addition, there have been tremendous advances based on understanding molecular and genomic pathways that make cancer cells preferentially grow abnormally and developing extremely intelligent targeted therapies to inhibit these pathways. Um, if you think about it, chemotherapy is pretty crude. We're killing all rapidly dividing cells. It's not very targeted. And targeted therapies are, uh, offer the opportunity to potentially improve outcome with less toxicity as they're more precise. So um, in terms of uh, some of the new drugs that have been uh, changing uh, the face of breast cancer, one of the most important category of medications over the last number of years are a category of drugs which are called CDK4-6 inhibitors or cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and 6 inhibitors. So these kinases and cyclin-D play a very important role in the regulation of cell cycle progression. And in cancer, these pathways are upregulated, and that upregulation of this cell cycle progression pathway causes abnormal tumor prol proliferation and resistance to our anti-estrogen therapies. Palbociclib is the first uh, of, in its class to be FDA approved. It is one of the CGK46 inhibitors. These are oral medications which block the pathway and thereby result in cell cycle arrest and they have been proven clinically to delay the time to endocrine resistance. So the Paloma 2 is a trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016. This was a randomized trial in metastatic breast cancer patients who are hormone receptor positive and HER2 new negative and had not previously received any therapy for their newly diagnosed metastatic disease. They were randomly assigned to either receive the standard of care of anti-estrogen therapy alone, in this case an aromatase inhibitor, versus an aromatase inhibitor plus the CGK46 inhibitor. And this study showed a, essentially a doubling of the progression-free survival or the amount of time that that disease was responding to that therapy. There have been later uh, studies with uh, one of the three uh, available CDK4-6 inhibitors that are now not just showing progression-free survival benefit, but overall survival benefit as well. Um, and at, at the current time, anti-estrogen therapy plus CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy is now the standard of care for hormone receptor positive HER2 new negative breast cancer. So when we have these new drugs, we always want to, there's tons of unanswered questions and what other role can we use them, et cetera. And um, here are some of our studies, a couple of our studies that look at um, where else can we go with the CDK4-6 inhibitors. So research question number one here is can we extend the benefit that we see with the CDK4-6 inhibitors in a hormone receptor positive HER2 negative uh, patient population to a hormone receptor positive HER2 positive population. So patients who are estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 new positive, which are about 15% of all breast cancers. Currently, the standard of care, regardless of hormone receptor status, for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer is traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy in combination with two antibodies to the HER2 protein, trastuzumab and pertuzumab, otherwise known as Herceptin and Pergida. 
But at this point in time, no studies have looked at the role of CGK4-6 inhibitors in HER2 positive breast cancer patients. So at the Dubin Breast Center, we have a multi-center trial of anastrozole, one of the aromatase inhibitors, palbocyclib, CDK4-6 inhibitor, in combination with trastuzumab and pertuzumab as first-line therapy for hormone receptor positive, HER2 new positive metastatic breast cancer. This is an investigator-initiated trial that we have at Sinai, and it's soon to open at NYU, Columbia, and Cornell. It's accruing well. This study really represents a novel, fully targeted approach to allow patients with HER2, HER2 hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive breast cancer to potentially avoid or delay traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy as we are currently able to do in hormone receptor positive HER2 new negative patients who can do well with sequential endocrine therapy sometimes for years. In all of oncology, the question always is, we find new drugs that improve uh, survival in metastatic disease, um, improve progression-free survival, but the real important question here is if we introduce them into the earlier stage setting, will we, able, will we be able to cure more patients to never have a recurrence? So at the Dubin Breast Center, we're participating in the uh, PALACE trial, the palbocyclib collaborative adjuvant study, which is a randomized study for stage two or three hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer patients. And everyone in the trial receives the standard anti-estrogen medication that would be appropriate for them. The experimental arm receives a CDK4-6 inhibitor for two of the years of the standard anti-estrogen medication. And um, it's a 4,600 patient trial. The primary endpoint is disease-free survival, and it recently closed to accrual. So over the next number of years, we may be able to offer these drugs, which are currently only used in metastatic disease, to cure more of our early stage patients. Very exciting. Next major advance I'm going to speak about is immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is kind of the hot buzzword that all the patients come in and ask about. And in fact, immunotherapy has been extremely effective in a variety of cancers, most effective in cancers that are highly mutated, which are more immunogenic, which are easily recognizable as other than a patient's normal cells. <coughs> And again, um, these, these drugs are widely used in many different types of breast cancer, but this past year has been the first time that the, these um, immunotherapies have shown any benefit in breast cancer. So PGL1 is a receptor on the surface of immune cells, and cancer-mediated upregulation of this receptor inhibits T cells that might otherwise attack cancer cells. So this effectively puts what we call a checkpoint on the immune system and allows cancer cells to evade the immune system. Antibodies, which are called checkpoint inhibitors, bind to this PDL1 receptor, thereby allowing T cells to attack cancer cells. So basically, restoring immune function or unleashing a patient's own immune system to be able to fight the cancer cells and recognize them as other. So, um, uh, Triple negative breast cancer, again, breast cancer that does not express estrogen, progesterone, or the HER2 receptors, referred to as triple negative breast cancer. It's the most aggressive form of breast cancer, highly mutated more than other subtypes, suggesting a potential role for immunotherapy. It's also been shown when the pathologist describes extensive lymphocytic infiltration in a triple negative breast cancer pathology specimen that that has been associated with a better prognosis in patients with triple negative breast cancer, suggesting a role in this type of breast cancer for immunotherapy. This past fall, the Impassion 130 trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a randomized trial for newly diagnosed metastatic triple negative breast cancer patients who were randomly assigned to either receive chemotherapy, in this case with a microtubule inhibitor called abraxane, plus or minus a checkpoint inhibitor, in this case atezolizumab, there are multiple checkpoint inhibitors. And this was the first study to really show any role for immunotherapy in breast cancer with a median overall survival of 25 versus 15 months for the patients who receive the immunotherapy in addition to the chemotherapy. So what are some of our studies uh, addressing ongoing questions for the use of checkpoint inhibitors? Research question number one here, will other chemotherapy agents in combination with other checkpoint inhibitors have activity in breast cancer, and is there efficacy in the hormone receptor positive population as well? 
So the study that we have addressing this is a phase one study evaluating the safety and tolerability of gervalumab, which is a checkpoint inhibitor, in combination with aribulin in patients with HER2 negative breast cancer patients. They can be hormone receptor positive or negative. The rationale, aribulin is a very active chemotherapy agent. It's actually derived from the marine sponge and has been shown to have a survival benefit compared to other chemotherapies that we use in metastatic breast cancer with some less toxicities. Aribulin has been shown to increase tumor perfusion, which may allow tumor infiltrating lymphocytes to penetrate tumor better and thereby increase the effectiveness of immunotherapy. The objective of this trial is to determine the safe dose of this combination, describe toxicities, and obtain preliminary evidence of efficacy. The trial is fully accrued and um, now close to accrual, and we're going to be looking at analyzing the results soon. Again, the important question is, as we, can we move immunotherapy into the treatment of earlier stage disease and cure more patients, prevent metastatic disease? So patients with triple negative breast cancer are frequently treated with preoperative chemotherapy. And those that are found to have residual invasive cancer in the surgical specimen are at significantly higher risk for recurrence or metastasis than patients who have no residual cancer found at the time of surgery. We are participating in a randomized trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of pembrolizumab, which is one of the checkpoint inhibitors, as adjuvant therapy for patients with triple negative breast cancer with greater than one centimeter of residual invasive cancer found at the time of surgery or positive lymph nodes. Patients are randomized to observation versus every three-week checkpoint inhibitor for one year. The goal of the study is to see a difference in disease-free survival, hopefully overall survival, and describe toxicities. I'm going to finish off talking about another category of very exciting drugs um, in the treatment of breast cancer, which are called PARP inhibitors. Essentially, BRCA mutated cancer BRCA mutated cells in general are characterized as having difficulty repairing DNA damage. And PARP is an enzyme that helps to repair DNA damage. Thereby, inhibiting PARP could be lethal to a BRCA positive cell that already can't repair DNA damage. In a clinical trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in August of 2017, 302 patients with germline BRCA mutations and metastatic breast cancer were randomized to receive one of the PARP inhibitors called Olaparib or treatment of physician's choice, which was one of three standard cytotoxic chemotherapies, in this case either capecitabine, aribulin, or vinarelbine. The risk of death or disease progression was 42% lower with Olaparib than treatment of physician's choice of standard chemotherapy, and tumor shrinkage rate was 60% versus 29% with significantly less toxicity for the PARP inhibitor. So these are now standardly used in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer in BRCA mutated patients. Again, the recurring question, can we move the PARP inhibitors into the earlier stage of disease and hopefully cure more BRCA-positive breast cancer patients? So we participated in a pilot study evaluating the anti-tumor activity and safety of niraparib, which is one of the PARP inhibitors, as preoperative treatment in localized HER2-negative BRCA-mutated breast cancer. This trial has also just closed to accrual, and the objective is to evaluate the anti-tumor activity of the PARP inhibitor when used as preoperative treatment, assessed by change in tumor volume on breast MRI and ultrasound, and also to evaluate the pathologic complete response rate or the chance of finding no residual disease at the time of surgery as added to standard therapy. I'm going to stop there, and um, I guess Dr. Port will tie it up. Take Thank you, Amy. Really exciting development. So um, I hope what you've learned today with these three talks that there's a lot going on at our center and that it really we really offer the full thickness of breast cancer treatment options and care, including the most cutting edge options to our mutual patients. Um, we are so appreciative of the support of the Mount Sinai community in sending us patients and honoring us with the care of your patients and um, look forward, obviously, to continuing many of these collaborations. 
I, I think right now what I'll do is open it up for questions um, for our three speakers, if anybody has any, any questions regarding these three topics or any other as it relates to the Dubin Breast Center. We have time for some questions. Mike, you want to start us off? So, it seems recently there's been more interest in male breast cancer, but of course the number of patients is very small. Mm -hmm. Have there been any suggestions that the treatment of the male should be different from the female? Sure, I'll take that. I think the key, you, you're right, um, we, male breast cancer is a very rare disease. Um, of the approximately 300,000 cases of breast cancer diagnosed in this country each year, less than 1% are in men, so it's about 2,500 to 3,000 cases. Um, we do see our fair share of those, um, I, in part because, you know, with the connection of Mount Sinai, what's very interesting is because of the preponderance of BRCA mutations in um, Ashkenazi Jews, and the BRCA2 mutation is associated with a higher risk of male breast cancer, we do get these patients a lot. Um, and, and the issue is, is because of the rarity, though, of the disease nationally, there's no ability to really conduct clinical trials looking at men alone. It's just the cases are too few, and too, sm too small a number and too few and far between. However, um, but, but we do extrapolate the treatment from, male, from female breast cancer to male and obviously hope to translate the benefits that we've seen in female breast cancer to men. So for example, things like sentinel node biopsy, which was a huge um, advance in female breast cancer approximately 20 years ago now uh, to stage lymph nodes under the arm. Um, one of my, I, I was at Sloan Kettering for 10 years before coming here, and one of my biggest areas of research was, is sentinel lymph node biopsy a valid way to assess nodes in men? It would seem intuitively obvious, but no one had really shown that. So I think along the way, what we've done is tried to um, validate the, the advances in treatment in women for men, and we definitely take care of our share. Um, you know, another, um, uh, example of this is, for example, the oncotype. You know, this is something that really isn't validated among men. These trials, these large trials, have few to any men I involved in them, so we don't know for sure that the data is absolutely applicable to men, but we use it nevertheless. Um, so I hope that answers your question. age of patient seems to be a very strong corollary for breast cancer. And uh, cellular aging, which is a different phenomenon, it seems to me by logic to be important. Do your studies look at age, even at the cellular level or the patient level, with regard to giving us an insight into this disease? I think it's a good question, you know, in the sense that I, what, you know, while we are all um, very affected by some of these very dramatic stories of breast cancer in young women, you know, the important thing to know is that in general, breast cancer is still a disease of older women. You know, the average age of a woman diagnosed with breast cancer in this country is still 60. And so, and you know, and, and the vast majority of the cases are in postmenopausal women. So I do think it is predominantly a disease of aging. In terms of measuring cell, cell age, I don't know that there's any objective measure of doing that. I don't think there's ever been shown to be any kind of research tool where you can determine age of a cell or health of a cell in that way on any kind of microscopic level. Great presentation, thank you. Nobody mentioned proton therapy. Proton therapy, it's, it's really an exciting area in the news. You know, we just opened up in combination or in collaboration, I would say, the proton center. And um, proton therapy, as it relates to breast cancer, is a very exciting area because it's, you know, the goal of proton therapy is obviously 
targeted treatment with minimal damage to healthy surrounding tissue. Um, it is still an area of research as it relates to breast cancer. One of the things that it's being looked at is, um, and, and I'll invite Dr. Schmidt up to make some additional comments as I'm sure all of you know, one of the biggest limitations of radiation when you do a lumpectomy and radiation is that treatment can only be done once. And so if someone recurs, the standard of care in that breast is to do a mastectomy because you can't give them radiation again. So that's one very active area of um, interest in protons as to whether or not you actually can give a second round of radiation perhaps in a different way. Um, Hank, do you want to address that further at all as it relates to IRT? Any comments about proton? Yeah, just that I think um, it's still definitely a research question in terms of breast cancer because as you know the resources are so scarce to study proton radiotherapy. I think that breast cancer is not quite high up enough on the priority list to have a lot of data generated so far. People are really looking to that modality to look at uh, CNS um, tumors and so forth. Yeah, but hopefully as we, um, as we have greater availability, hopefully through this new center, we'll be able to explore it in recurrent breast cancer, I think would be our target, certainly. Any, any questions, that's all? Yeah, please. Uh, I'm just for the second presenter, uh, there was, uh, in your study, you assigned this recurrence score to prior patients. I guess the, the gene data was valuable for those patients, and you could retrospectively do that? So I, I talked about a few, it's an excellent question. I talked about a few different studies. The kind of first wave of studies used tissue blocks from large randomized control trials from the past. Um, and then some of the later studies that I talked about were prospective. So used kind of ongoing accrual of patients and use their tissue. Does that answer your question? Um, and then, so then you you just kind of quantify how those whether those different risk groups would were receiving chemotherapy. So in the prospective study, the the kind of last one that I talked about, the Taylor X trial, they actually randomized, they did this recurrence score and then randomized patients based on the recurrence score to either receive endocrine therapy alone or chemotherapy with endocrine therapy and compared those two groups. The initial retrospective studies used tissue blocks, looked at the scores, categorized people into different groups, and then a subsequent study looked at whether those groups were also prognostic, so whether chemotherapy kind of affected each of those different groups differently. Great, thanks. Well, let's thank our speakers for their talks today. Thank you,